Um, good afternoon and welcome to today's program featuring Rob Manning, class of 1980, who serves as JPL's chief engineer. My name is Nancy Mitchell and I serve as director of alumni relations uh, at Whitman College. Today and throughout the weekend, Rob and his classmates are celebrating their 40th reunion, which should have taken place back in September 2020. But because of COVID-19, um, the situation just prevented an in-person celebration. So the alumni office created a series of virtual events uh, that will take place over this weekend for the class of 80, as well as alumni from the classes of 89, 90, 91, 95, 2010, 2014, 15, and 16. Now we knew that Rob's presentation would be of interest outside of the reunion classes, so we invited all alumni parents and friends to join us today. And we had over 250 RSVPs for the program. Let me scroll down here. Before I introduce Rob, I just want to make a few announcements. This program is being recorded. In about 10 days, we will post video on the uh, virtual alumni webpage. So we suggest that if you want to share this um, with your family or friends or watch it again, uh, you will find the recording there. At the conclusion of Rob's remarks, there will be time for questions. We are going to ask you to put your questions in the chat and uh, or Q&A tool, and we will try and get uh, to as many of your questions as possible. Rob Manning completed the 3-2 engineering program at Whitman and Caltech in 1982. He has worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory ever since. From 1993 to 1997, he served as chief engineer for the 1997 Mars Pathfinder mission. Later, he served as the systems engineering manager, as well as the entry, descent, and landing manager for the twin Mars exploration rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, that landed in early 2004, and was chief engineer for the Mars Science Laboratory mission that landed Curiosity rover in 2012. For the past four years, Rob has been JPL's chief engineer. After the Spirit and Opportunity rover landings, the UB, the Walla Walla UB, uh, had an article. In that article, Rob credited the liberal arts skills he gained at Whitman um, that led to his career at the laboratory and his high profile work on the Mars mission. He also stated the discipline and study skills he developed while he was a student allowed him to fill, fulfill his dream of becoming a space engineer. In 2007, Rob was honored by the Whitman College Alumni Association as Alumnus of Merit. And I just think of what he's accomplished since 2007. And so, you know, maybe we have to have a super Alumnus of Merit Award. In 2015, he was invited to speak at Whitman's commencement ceremonies, and at that time, he was awarded an honorary Doctor of Science degree from Whitman College. Today, we have the privilege of hearing Rob's personal account of his and his team's adventures landing and exploring Mars over the past decades, including the recent Perseverance rover that landed on February 18th, 2021, as well as the recent breathtaking flights of the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. I watched both of those um, um, situations, um, the landing of, um, the rover and then the helicopter and um, goosebumps just flooded uh, flooded me. And um, just mentioning it um, today, I have that same sense of wonder and awe at what has been accomplished. So without any further comment, I will turn the program over to Rob. Rob, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nancy. And hi, everybody. It's a great uh, honor for me to speak with my classmates and uh, fellow Whitman alums and uh, family of alums. Uh, it's really great to be here. It's, uh, it's a real, uh, this is a real treat for me. I can tell you, this is, uh, it's really fun. I'm, um, I've, uh, I've been extraordinarily lucky uh, in my career. Um, and uh, I get, I really do give uh, Whitman a lot of credit for, for my, uh, uh, you know, for, well, for opening my eyes to a great education and particularly liberal arts education. You might say, well, you know, you know, there's a lot of focus on education uh, that that's tied toward 
you know, your career, career development. But you know what? There's plenty of time to learn your job. I, I, and I did not know anything about rocket science when I graduated from college. And so uh, but I had to learn on the job. And so really it's about learning how to be a learner and how to be a student your whole life. And so this is something I've been extraordinarily lucky to be able to do. And I, I'm a very curious person and I've really enjoyed uh, learning a vast number of skills and um, technologies and ideas and concepts. And uh, it's been a, and, and working with some of the most amazing people. Uh, it's, it's just an amazing thrill to work with these incredibly smart people from all over the world. Um, I'm pretty proud of this bunch. So let me let's start right up. Let me start, share my screen. I got to make sure I hit the right buttons. I was reminded uh, to hit the share sound and optimize video clip. And then I'll get that started right now and click that and then click on my um, uh, full display. Let's see if this works. There. How does that look, Nancy? Can you? Does that work? Okay. Looks like it does. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, oh, there's so much I could talk to you about. There's there's so many fun things to share, um, but I, I and I I only have an hour, <laughs> and I could I could I'm I'm famous at JPL for for a, being a storyteller. I love telling stories. I love sharing I uh, sharing what we do, and and I've been really lucky to be a lot of cool things. And I'll tell you about that in a second. But but uh, it's, it's always a challenge for me to figure out what. What not what to talk about what what not to talk about because there's so many cool so many wonderful things and and, and in fact I, did, I realized after I made this talk, created this talk that you know there's some pretty major things that I've not talked about specifically included in my talk that you may want to ask me questions about later uh, such as the connection between Mars and Earth so yeah, ask that question uh, uh, as we get to the end here. All right, so um, okay, this is a great, isn't that a cool picture? This is a, a, a gift. You can find this online um, at the at the JPL's website um, of, of, of our, of our uh, recent land arrival, Perseverance rover, and uh, which is looking, you can see it's turning its uh, mast, uh, toward, mast cam, uh, mast head looking at the uh, uh, ingenuity helicopter sitting there on the ground that uh, Nancy was just talking about. Anyway, so let's proceed. Um, I'm uh, I'm extraordinarily lucky as an engineer. Um, I after uh, I uh, was very lucky to have became a, after about 15 years at JPL became chief engineer for the Mars Pathfinder mission way back in '97, or actually in the early '90s, and then we landed it uh, in '97. And that's my daughter there. She's now 23 years old. Uh, she's sitting there on Sojourner rover model um, that we in our in our sandbox and used for testing the vehicle. Uh, later on, I was I was a part of a spirit and opportunity. I led the came up with the idea of spirit and opportunity with my with my colleagues. And uh, we designed these vehicles to drive around rovers to drive around Mars, which they did for a number of years. Uh, and uh, we landed them. And of course, I've been very lucky to even I, I led the landing team. And so after landing, I'm very relieved there you can see. Uh, there's Curiosity rover behind me. That's the actual rover uh, in, during a during a build up and testing of the flight flight rover before we sent it to Mars. Uh, and then we build another rover to test it with, and that's our that's our test area in our sandbox at JPL. Of course, uh, we then finally landed it, and uh, uh, I was very relieved. Uh, you can see me there. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons. So it's jobs like this is why I take. Blood pressure, blood pressure medication. Because <laughs> some of my some of the jobs I have have, have pretty intense uh, tense uh, moments. And I was also involved in the chief. I was chief engineer for another mission, actually, to test supersonic parachutes. I'll show you the pic, some moody, videos of that. Uh, so we build these test vehicles, which we launched out of Kauai a few years ago. And then, of course, we landed Spirit. I mean, landed a uh, Perseverance rover. Just in back in January, on January 18th, and there's there's me. I was the I did the I did the color commentary on the video there, and uh, and uh, our, even though there was nobody in New York City to watch it, because Times Square was pretty darn empty in February, uh, they 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 showed uh, the the whole landing sequence um, in the video uh, live on uh, in the, in Times Square, which is kind of cool. I mean, that's a you know, I don't get paid extra to do that, but I can tell you it's a lot of fun to uh, share this stuff with the world. So for me, Mars exploration started, you know, in my mind, uh, I was a little kid. 
uh, growing up in, uh, uh, in uh, as many of you were in the, in, in the class of 80, anywhere in the, in the 19, in the 60s. And we, I mean, we had these magazines lying around and, and some of you remember the Collier's magazine uh, 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 and uh, uh, there were paintings of what Mars exploration might look like. And so it was a vision for this that we thought back in the, that in this in the late 50s and early 60s that we thought we by the 1980s would be saying we'd have whole uh, crowds of people on Mars. And in fact, we see here is a glider that took uh, it would take 18 astronauts. This 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 is a, a really big glider envisioned by uh, Werner von Braun and uh, Chesley Bonestell, who is a, who is an artist who painted these things. Uh, he didn't do all the paintings, but this is a couple of well, at least one of them there. Um, and, but, but instead, uh, we've not sent people to Mars because it turns out it's really it's a kind of it's a really hard place to go to. Um, but uh, we've actually had a nice string of successes. I used to show this chart and, and there was more failures and successes. But you can see you've had a nice run of successes recently. We human. This is all uh, all of us, including the most recent two, which is both J, uh, both uh, JPL's Perseverance rover. Uh, as well as the Tianwen-1 uh, lander from China, which landed just very recently and has been very successful. But you can see that um, we've, there's, uh, the, 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 the wind loss record isn't terribly great, but you know, uh, we're getting better at it. And uh, hopefully we, we, this, this will, get, will continue to get better. But I can tell you, it's, it's, very easy, it's easy to get this wrong. And uh, we've, we've, uh, even the ones that succeed, we discovered little ways that they might not have succeeded had, had, had things not broken our way. Um, so, it's, so you can see, so Mars is, this is, this is a map of the entire planet of Mars. It uh, um, uh, shows, uh, shows where both crashes are, those, those splat marks <laughs> are crashes or near crashes, uh, and the X's mark the spot where people, where, where our, our missions worked. Um, you can see Mars is now getting a little crowded with, uh, with uh, human detritus and uh, um, that we've that we've brought brought to Mars, and uh, most of those most of those missions are not working anymore, or never did. Um, but you can see there's still four, four now. There are four working robots on Mars: Insight lander, um, which I'm not going to talk about today, but our Curiosity rover, which is just south of the uh, Insight there on the right, um, Perseverance there on the left, uh, in uh, Jezero Crater, and Tianwen One and its rover uh, up in. Uh, 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 up, um, up in the middle, lower upper right there, in the in the flat plains of the, of the giant crater. Um, so it, 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 there's been a there's been a um, let me get this animated. There's there's, there, there's been a lot more missions recently, landed missions recently. You can see uh, uh, we've had a, we've had a nice stretch of them, um, and they've been working pretty darn well. Um, Rover these vehicles don't last forever. But they do last for quite a while. Um, they um, they do pretty well. And then, and, but for for the for the, our, for the U.S. missions, we've been uh, uh, the 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 model uh, the mot motto that we've been using for exploration is talking about following the water. And what I mean by that is we've been trying to. You know, you've heard it, and it got a little tiresome. I, I will admit, you all heard it. Oh, we discovered water on Mars. Yeah, I know. We've heard about that before. Haven't you guys heard this before? Yeah, we, yeah, we, we keep following, finding water. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's just the fact that the story is more complex than just finding water. Yeah, there's a lot more water on Mars than we ever thought. And the more we look at Mars, the more we realize there's, it's still a pretty darn uh, wet place. It, it wet in terms of lots of water. In fact, um, um, and, and most of that water uh, that was on Mars that we believe created oceans are, is still there uh, under the ground in, and, and bonded to, uh, to, uh, to rocks. And so uh, that's something that's, that's actually a fairly recent discovery. Bethany Elman at Caltech and her researchers uh, have made that conclusion uh, doing new calculations. Now, there are still questions. There's not much air there. And I'll talk a little bit more about Mars in a second. But, but uh, uh, there's plenty of evidence that water flowed on the surface of Mars, and Mars is a very wet world um, three and a half billion years ago. Uh, it was a, it, it's, it's, looks pretty darn dry today. If you were in Mars, you would, you know, it's, it's well, it's, ah, I need to go get a drink. Where, where do I go? Um, well, you make sure you go just, there's certain places to go, but you might have to dig pretty deep, get some dynamite with you, and uh, bring a Bunsen burner or something and melt it. Um, get the, to push, get the water out of the rock, but it's there. 
if you can, if you if you have the right equipment, you can pull it out and uh, you can even drink it, drink it if you if you just distill it properly. So um, so we know it's wet and habitable. Great. Um, uh, uh, and I'll and I'll talk about which missions did that in a minute. But uh, but the real quick thing about Mars is it's, it's, it doesn't have an atmosphere today. Now it, it's also actually not the friendliest place to go. You know, um, we remember uh, Elton John talking about. Uh, Mars ain't kind of, kind of place to raise your kids. Well, it still isn't a good place to raise your kids. It's barely a good place to raise your robots, for that matter. Um, so we've got, so we have spirit. There, there's not, so there's um, uh, Mars and Earth compared there on the screen. Um, Mars is further away from the from 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 Earth, uh, further from the Sun than Earth. Almost, uh, it's about the same distance again, almost. Um, and it's so it's gets less sunlight. The sun's smaller if you're on Mars. If you're on Mars, though. It's kind of hard. You think you have a hard time pressing to, hard press to tell the difference. A bright sunny day on Mars kind of looks like a bright sunny day on Earth. It's just that it's really cold. It's a very cold place. The surface of Mars, uh, even in the summertime, if, by the equator, you know, going to go you know, down to the equator of Mars and do your do your summer vacation, uh, you'll be pleased to know that the surface of Mars will get well above room temperature at your feet. But if you stand up your nose will be 40 degrees below zero, which is uh, pretty darn cold. It gets cold quick. And there's hardly any air there. It's only 2%, I'm sorry, only 1% the density of Earth's atmosphere. And it's all carbon dioxide, almost all carbon dioxide. There's trace other trace gases, but it's it's so it's, it's not a great place. You got to bring a spacesuit. Um, and uh, the good news is it's smaller than Earth. You can, you can, it's, it's, your gravity is only three eighths of Earth's gravity, so you can hop around in your in your in your boots. And if you if you're and if you if you're inside your space, if you you know if you're if you watch The Martian, you can be inside your space space station, and you can be bouncing around, and you can be able to uh, uh, enjoy the lower gravity. Um, but it's a pretty harsh place. Another thing about see, Earth is another has a really cool thing. We have this moon. This be thankful for you. We look up at the moon, say thanks, moon. The moon's there. The moon has been doing us a real favor. The moon produces tidal forces on Earth. Not as it does affect the oceans, but it's actually among the 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 the, uh, uh, the, the primary reasons why our core of the central core of Earth is still liquid and the iron circulates um, and it, it keeps keeps the inside of the Earth. The moon's tidal forces actually helps keep keeps the Earth warm inside. And what does that do? Well, that produces, um, that allows us to have a magnetic field. Uh, so what does a magnetic field do, do for you? Well, the magnetic field on Earth uh, is acts like a force field. And it literally, um, as, as high energy charged particles from the sun or, and, or for deep space comes roaring toward Earth, they get, they spiral along um, around the, the, the field lines, so the magnetic field lines, and they get and they get deflected from us, and they get launched back up again. So many of them will get launched toward the north and south poles, and they'll turn around and go back the other way. And so the cool thing about that is that we actually really it's like a Star Trek force field for for so that means it, high energy particles aren't raining down on us, causing us cancer. Um, Mars also doesn't have oxygen. Now we have plants um, that, that could, thankfully, thank, thanks to plants for producing all this wonderful oxygen that we breathe. Um, and, but the great thing about oxygen, when it gets higher in the, the upper part of the atmosphere, the sun breaks oxygen down and reacts with the oxygen and produces ozone, O3. And uh, ozone absorbs ultraviolet light. Mars has neither a magnetic field um, to, to deflect particles nor does it have oxygen because there's no plants. Yeah, uh, and so uh, uh, so that means there's no protection for for creatures or people or things on the surface of Mars from uh, ultraviolet rays of the sun, um, uh, from from ozone protected by ozone. Nor the magnetic field. So because of those two things, Mars is a really, you know, I, you know, I know a lot of people would like to go to Mars and. You were talking about moving people to Mars, but you know, if you go to Mars, you got to protect yourself. Make sure you bring a bit of Earth with you, as we do with our rovers. So it all started, for at least for the United States, we the first missions actually to explore Mars, the, the surface of the two Viking missions. And guess what? They landed in 1976. And if those of you, those of you from the class of 80 probably graduated in, 19, uh, in the summer of 1976. And that summer, not long after we graduated, these two landers landed on Mars and, and um, uh, we're very depressing because th there was a lot of people who 
not scientists, but a lot of people who kind of expected they were hoping to see some little critters or little, you know, things running around. Um, even Carl, the great Carl Sagan, remember Carl Sagan from Cosmos? Um, he said, I mean, he, he wanted to put a flashlight in this thing so he could take pictures at night because he was, he thought maybe you might be able to catch little creatures moving and hiding under the rocks um, and, uh, or climbing around. Um, but sure enough, there's nothing there. And they, once you got there and you realize there was nothing there, there's no ultraviolet light. I mean, there's, uh, there's no uh, ozone layer, there's no oxygen. Uh, it's cold as blazes. Uh, cosmic rays and solar particles come raining down. It's really a nasty place to live. And, uh, and they found out that the Mar surface of Mars appeared to be somewhat sterile. And that's not surprising. Um, there were some still mysteries, mind you, chemical mysteries that this, were not answered by Viking, that Viking discovered mysteries, but they could not answer them. Uh, but, but we went on and we left with those mysteries unanswered. Um, uh, we're getting better at answering them. Uh, we then landed um, uh, 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 Pathfinder. Um, my team and I, 20 years later, landed, landed this, 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 uh, this, this little rover. Now you might say, What's, what was Pathfinder for? Was it, what was its scientific objective? There was no scientific objective. It was, its whole purpose in life is to, perp to prove that we can go to Mars cheaply and move around so someday we can build a bigger rover that can actually do this. So it's really an engineering demonstration mission, even though we did have science instruments on board, rudimentary ones of that, uh, both on the rover and on the lander. And a, we had a weather station, we, could, we, could, we, have, we, we had uh, multi-spectral imaging cam color cameras that could look at, look at uh, elemental compositions or, or spectral compositions of some of the rocks um, from a distance by looking from, from a landing site. And there's, so there's the landed envelope and there's a little Sojourner rover. Uh, and there's a little Sojourner there um, up in the upper right there, uh, sniffing away at Yogi uh, back in 1997. Now the cool thing about a lander, I mean, you know, think, well, great, you, you get there, but the, the bad thing about a lander is that you get there and you look around, it's like, oh, look at those two hills over there. And then, I wonder what's on there. I wonder if there's any rock crop crops. I don't know. There's no rock crop. I can't tell, it's too far away. Wouldn't it be nice to walk over there? Well, we could send a little Sojourner, right? Well, no, unfortunately, Sojourner only had a radio range, had radio contact with the lander, could only go about as far as your back as our backyard. And you know, I, you know, you know, if we got further than about a half a football field away, it would lose radio contact with the lander. So you really needed it to uh, operate it. So uh, that rover was kind of tethered to that lander, even though there was no real tether. But uh, um, what we did realize is that no. Well, we, Another thing we learned is that when you're driving around uh, on Mars and you see, look at the size of those rocks compared to Sojourner. When you're that small, rocks that are this high are really scary. And so that was, that's sort of the situation that we learned on Sojourner that, you know, we really need a bigger rover I mean, just, just to get, get around over the surface. Because look at that, there's, there's, it's, this, is a, this is a very dangerous place to drive on. Anyway, um, a few later, a, a couple years later, we're trying. We're, we sent a lander to the to this to the south pole of Mars, and it vanished. It disappeared. Plunk, gone. Um, and uh, uh, we haven't found it yet. Uh, it's it's called Mars Polar Lander. Um, and so we've we've got more image here, more contiguous contiguous image imagery at high resolution taken by the high-rise camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter of that area of Mars than anywhere else on Mars. Because my teammates and I have been hunting, take, asking them to take pictures for us and hunting down that, that, uh, uh, that lander. And we found, found even a piece of it. Um, so it, it's there um, it's somewhere. And if any of you, uh, any of you, uh, 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 you know, people who are, any of you who are in your thirties, uh, you might be old enough you get to, they're, just, they're, they're sending people who are in their 60s and 70s on these trips because <clears throat> the the more the older you are, the more likely you are to sub, survive the radiation effects of your life. So maybe maybe some of you will become will be astronauts, Mars astronauts. If you do, could you go find it for me? It's there somewhere. Let me know if you find it. Anyway, anyway, so after the Mar after that failure, we uh, my teammates and I came up with the idea of modifying. Mars Pathfinder, which is the picture on the left, there's that, and there's a little Sojourner there. It's like somebody sat on it there. Um, that wasn't my daughter sitting on that that caused that. It was just, it was just, that's how it's supposed to look. Um, and uh, uh, and what we did is, well, what if we took that electronics box, that white box with the JPL letters and the US flag there, 
in the circle and converted that into a tetrahedral shaped rover the same size and we can adapt the same entry descent landing architecture and everything and just stuff it in there and just change the design that's exactly what we did and that became mars exploration rover spirit and opportunity and uh we landed those uh we, spirit got a chance to uh, uh climb up a hill uh opportunity went on for and, and, and it, spirit i think lasted six or seven years and uh opportunity landed lasted for about 12 years i think before they kicked out um uh lost uh, basically an opportunity we lost uh, just a few years ago uh due to uh due to a massive dust star uh and it wasn't dust accumulating on those solar rail solar rays you see on top it's it's like night lights out if you were there on mars during the dust storm you need a flashlight in the middle of the day it's so dark and and you, you need light at least rovers were we designed them for 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 you know, assuming the sun show, sun rose every day. And that was a pretty fundamental assumption. Like, oh, we're, let's assume that the sun will rise every day. What do you guys think? Yep. Okay, good. We're good for that. And so, um, and so we did. Unfortunately, um, the design didn't work when the sun didn't show up. And then sun didn't show up for quite a while, uh, for weeks. By the way, there's a cool, I love this picture. Check this one on the right. This is take, this is an image taken from orbit um, of our landing site. And you see these little, these little dots here. Can you guess what those are? Yes, you can. Those are airbag bounce marks. So we 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 the, the, this the first bounce is here. Boing 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 boing. And look at it, like a hole in one. We we did, we did a little putt and landed right here in the in the in the hole. And there is the lander right there in the upper right, uh, in, in that upper part part of the image. Uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and off we went. It was fun. Isn't that cool. And so, well, so we've had kind of an invasion of rovers. So we, so we had a little sojourner there. We had uh, uh, Spirit and Opportunity. Um, and by the way, I'm skipping two landers. I don't want to I feel bad about that. Phoenix Lander and then uh, Insight Lander, which are very cool, very cool missions, both of which I worked a lot of, uh, uh, I worked on all those those missions as well. But so we, so the whole trick, so, we, so look at this, this we're getting bigger rovers. Oh. This is the next rover after this. We're getting even really bigger. No, I'm joking. That's not a real rover. That's that's just a uh, uh, this. So we so so why are we getting bigger? There's so you know, bigger is not necessarily better. The bigger the bigger the thing you're trying to land on Mars, the more expensive, the harder it is to land. The the, the bigger rockets you need, um, you bigger you need bigger heat shields. You know, parachutes may not be possible. It's real. It's a real nightmare. Um, uh, but we needed. But but we need. We, 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 Spirit and opportunity. I missed that little detail. Uh, spirit and opportunity. Um, we're very fortunate. They both, both they landed on either side of Mars, and they were both told us, um, really within a year or two of their first operation, that uh, that uh, that Mars was had been wet, not just for short periods of time. Because up to that point. We saw evidence of water flowing, but we didn't know whether that water was a transient. In other words, there, there, imagine, imagine a meteor coming along, slamming into Mars. There's frozen, imagine frozen water underneath the ground. It causes the water to race up. And, and those of you, those in Walla Walla, everybody remember, remember we grew up near the Scablands, you know, uh, Moses Lake, Tri-Cities area. That was all, remember, that was all a massive flood, flood area. And there, there was a giant lake about 13 to 15,000 15, years ago at the end of the last ice age, uh, Lake Missoula. And there was a big ice dam there, if you remember. And it, of course, we went around then, but you remember hearing the story. And that ice dam broke at the end of the ice, uh, more than once at the end of the last ice age. And this massive amount of water, uh, like a small Great Lakes of water, went coursing across eastern Washington through the, through the uh, uh, well, little gap. And then racing down to through the Columbia Gorge, fill backfilling it, going out to the ocean, but also backfilling all the way up to the down to the Willamette, filling up the whole area of water, bringing with it huge boulders that came from Idaho, floating on ice rafts all the way across eastern Washington. And that same thing happened on Mars. So we saw that. We knew that. But the question is, was that just a transit? Did that just happen? Because you can't, if you if you're looking for possibility of finding life. That 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 uh, the water needs to stick around. You don't want to, you want you want to have lakes and oceans if you can. If you, but we didn't have proof that those existed until Spirit and Opportunity landed, and we found that that rocks 
can, by looking at the rocks, you can deduce whether or not those rocks have been submerged in waters for long, for long periods of time. And so, and so that's exactly what happened. We, we ended up uh, uh, convincing ourselves that, yay, verily, um, those rocks had been underwater for long periods of time, long enough for giving an opportunity for life to exist, evolve, and fl potentially flourish. However, what we didn't know after Spirit and Opportunity landed, and we, we drove around, whether or not the conditions for life for were, were there. In other words, was the, was the environment, even if there was water there, doesn't mean the water is habitable. What if, what if the water has a pH of two? What, it's, what if it's acid? Um, uh, what if it has um, really uh, gnarly chemicals in it? I mean, it, it, it the really question was, was, it a con was the conditions right for, um, for example, uh, uh, chemophilic uh, uh, life, life, single cell organisms, like as we understand on this planet, there's plenty of organisms that love to eat rock under the right conditions, the right redox potential in the, in the material, they will survive, they'll be happy, they'll just munch away. And they'll be able to, and, and maybe, maybe, so, so, so the real question is, we now know when Mars was wet for long periods of time, we didn't know whether it was habitable. So we sent, a, we needed to, to that answer that question, we need a bigger rover. And that bigger rover needed to have labs in it, kind of laboratory equipment that, that fit. In fact, the amount of laboratory equipment uh, that was in Curiosity weighed as much as, as almost all of Spirit and Opportunity Rover, a, 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 spirit, a, a spirit Rover. Um, so, so we had to, we had to go large. And so, uh, make sure click here. And so we did, and we landed it. Ah, thank, thankfully. Um, and uh, we've been um, back in 2012, uh, August 2020, 2012. It was, uh, uh, and yay, verily, within, within uh, a matter of uh, a year, less than a year after we landed, when by, by February, around February, March of 2013, just less than a half a year, uh, about half a year after we landed, we confirmed, we turned out, we got really lucky. We landed in a, 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 an ancient lake bed, a lake bed that was around three and a half billion years ago. And, and, and sure enough, the chemicals in that, in that, in that very finely, um, uh, uh, finely laid out clay, those clays, phyllosilicate clays, um, uh, were indeed uh, laid down with fresh water. And there was that had a, had a very neutral pH. It, the, the rock itself had plenty of redox potential for life to live. So what we discovered is that yes, Mars was a habitable place, at least where we landed um, and, and inside Gale Crater next to Mount Sharp. And uh, now the rover has been tootling up. It's been, she's been driven, driven about 20 some kilometers and it's driven uh, since 2012 and it's and it's marched its way up to uh, to the side of Mount Mount, Mount Sharp. And uh, in fact, check out this this that cliff there. It's such a cool cliff. We we drove right up to that thing, and, and we have we have a robotic arm that that can that can take samples and put them off into our laboratories inside the rover. And uh, and that's what we've been doing um, ever since we landed. And it's been a, it's been a real uh, amazing mission. And we've really. You know, when, when I first started doing this Mars exploration stuff in the 90s, um, you could buy a book called Mars. It's about, it was this big. There's a couple books, maybe two books. So the total amount of books was about this thick. Now, if you were to try to make a book about Mars based on all these things we've been learning, not just for landers, but from our, our orbiters, it, 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 it would fill up a room. It's unbelievable how much stuff we've learned. And, and, and we've learned that Mars is a much, it's much more interesting than we, than we feared it might be. Uh, um, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we were afraid it was going to be very boring, like a bunch, just a bunch of iron and dead. Turns out Mars is red because of this, uh, this the oxygen that was in the atmosphere, uh, we believe, um, oxidized Mars and uh, left this red powder everywhere. But if you had a gar giant garden hose and you squirted Mars with a garden hose and little, get a little brush out, Mars would be a as, as beautiful as the Grand Canyon or other places was full of colors um, because there's incredible richness of mineralogy uh, and, uh, and chemistry on Mars, uh, just like it is on this planet. Okay, so now the question is, did Mars ever have life? And uh, uh, you know, 
we do know the service of Mars is sterile. It doesn't necessarily mean that there that that uh, it was like that. It certainly, was not like that before. In order to support an a, a, a lakes and and oceans on Mars, you need an atmosphere to keep the water from boiling away. And so there was clearly it was a different world then, clearly a different time. And maybe uh, and and the water was there long enough that you could you could make the case that that you know if Earth had life three and a half billion years ago, why wouldn't Mars? We're all these planets, all these planets are all kind of born at the same time. And so we're kind of going through the, the stages where uh, Mars and Earth are our siblings. And so uh, why, why wouldn't that be the case? And, and if so, could it be that the life is still on Mars? Not necessarily on the surface, because we know the surface is a nasty place, but the underground, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but there, 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 uh, there's many people, as people who do, uh, this, do this kind of research, who believe that the, the biomass on this planet, the bulk of the biomass of this planet is actually by weight underground in rocks below your feet. Isn't that cool? Um, it's basically single cell organisms that are trapped in cracks going down kilometers maybe below your feet all over the planet, including under the oceans. So uh, uh, yes, um, uh, my, you know, if you were an alien and you were, and you were, and just had a kind of life meter and you're looking at coming to this earth and this planet and you would double a meter so, and, and you didn't really stay carefully, but you knew where all the life was. You would say, yes, uh, uh, earth, life exists on earth um, inside its rocks. Oh yeah, there's some debris also on the surface and in the oceans, but most of it's in the rock. Nothing like being debris, huh? Anyway, so uh, uh, so we're, we're, the question is, can we find evidence of that ancient life? And would it be still around after three and a half billion years? Well, it turns out it's hard to find it. Even if you left life on the surface of, of, of Mars for, for three and a half billion years, if you exposed it to the cosmic rays and solar, solar radiation, it would break down. And it does break down. And it doesn't last, doesn't last three and a half billion years. It may not even last 100 million years. Um, but, but, uh, but underground, it's a different matter. And so the question is, can we go to places that have been exposed? Curiosity went to a place where that had been exhumed um, it, it was once covered that that lake bed we visited um, at, at uh, Yellowknife Bay. It's called. Yes, it was. It was. It was covered. But then, but then, millions of years or hundreds of millions of years later, it, it became uncovered, and uh, we were able to explore it. It get uncovered because even though there's only one percent density of atmosphere on Mars, there's still enough wind over long periods of time, vast deep time, to move that material off of the surface. And, uh, and to move it, large, vast amounts of material. But you have to be patient. You'd have to be someone who doesn't mind living to several hundred million years um, to see that. So we have this rover. This is, this is over right here. Um, this is uh, uh, Mars 2020. It looks a lot like Curiosity, doesn't it? it no question. It's not a coincidence. We, uh, we took the Curiosity design in, in every respect and then modified it. Uh, we, we hacked away at the front. We moved the labs. We put some new stuff in there. Um, so we're there to study uh, geology, astrobiology, and we're collecting samples. They go, collecting samples? For whom? We'll get to that. Um, uh, and so, uh, in fact, the thing you're seeing here uh, where the arm, look at how big that massive arm is. It's really, with the, that thing on the end of the arm weighs 70 kilograms or, you know, something like uh, uh, almost, you know, approaching 300 pounds. It's a pretty big piece of equipment there at the end of the arm. Um, but it, it, inside the arm is this massive, at the end of the arm is this massive coring, coring drill that's going to take core samples. And uh, we also have some, also at the end of the arm, is, there's, there's a, a laser spectrometer um, that's, uh, that's looking at the, looking at the uh, 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 mineralogy of the rock at a fine scale, a, a, micros, a microscopic camera. Um, it's also good at taking selfies. I'm sure you've seen that before. Uh, and then, uh, 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 we're, we're, so we're able to do very much some wonderful microscopic analysis of this soil, but the my purpose of this thing is to collect samples. So let's talk about how we got there. So, uh, so Jezero Crater is where we landed, and, and, and I'm sure you can look at this, and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a planetary scientist to say, oh yeah, that looks like mud that flowed in. There's water coming from the left, rolling downhill from those off the hills into this round crater and filling up and leaving this mud fan 
on the surface of of, of, uh, of Mars. And uh, and to give a sense of scale, um, that circle there is the landing ellipse we lean for. It's actually more of a circle than ellipse. And you can see it's about the size of downtown San Francisco. Get a sense of scale. So a little about so so remember now I'm not a scientist. I'm an engineer. I make stuff. And um, so I make this. I make the equipment that designed it, the, the 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 rovers, designed the landing systems, um, I, uh, designed the tools, the methodology, all the things. And my team teammates and I work together with companies and organizations around the world to get this stuff built. So let me explain something about first of all about getting to Mars. So getting to Mars is a pain. It turns out. Um, uh, it turns out. Um, so the real trick here is that you uh, uh, you uh, so. Earth is, takes an orbit here in blue, and you see Mars takes a, an orbit further out um, in red here. And so the idea is they both move around the sun, sun in the same direction. So Earth, Earth is going this way, and as it turns, you can then launch your vehicle. What you do is you leave Earth's orbit, and you go into the orbit around the sun. You make a big uh, egg-shaped elliptical orbit around the sun. And it's, by the way, you can launch that to that orbit anytime you want there's any there's no restrictions you can just launch in fact you, you probably want to do it um you, and typically we don't launch in the direction earth is already moving so earth gives our vehicle a little bit of an extra boost because we're moving that way and we're we give it a little bit faster boost and it goes all the way out here and then back again um so you can do that anytime you want however mars may not be there when you get there and so as soon as you get out uh, this part of you uh, this, this part of your orbit you're going to fall back in toward the sun and then by then, Earth will have been gone, and it just goes into this forever in this big loop. And so the real key here is to launch, launch your vehicles in such a way that Mars is there when you get there. That only happens about every 26 months. And, that, and the window of opportunity for that to happen is only about three weeks long. So if you're building something to go to Mars, you got to make sure you're done with your testing and building, and, and you can put it on a rocket in time to go. Um, we have not always been successful at that. Um, uh, Curiosity Rover, uh, the one I was chief engineer for, um, uh, we realized a year, about a year and a half before launch, there's just no way we're going to make the launch date. The, that we're going to be late. And so trouble is when you're late, now you have to wait 26 months. Uh, and can you mention what NASA, NASA says when that happens? Like, okay, how, you're going to be late. How late are you going to be? Oh, well, 26 months. This is well. You're that far behind? Uh, no, but we're not going to make the window. And so, and so, uh, uh, we learned long ago that um, the bus to Mars leaves every 26 months, and so you just miss the bus and have to go later. And so, so it turns out that Mar as you come go around here in this big yellow ellipse, you're actually kind of going. You come out here at the end, you're going a little bit slow. You're going slower than Mars. So actually, Mars comes in and waxy from behind. So you don't think of that, right? You don't think of it. Well, don't you, we're gonna. I'm aiming for Mars. I'm gonna go hit Mars. No, you go out there, come to a stop. Not stop, but a slow way down up there, and then Mars is gonna plow in from behind. So you gotta be ready and turn yourself around and face Mars when it comes on heads heads on uh, uh, heading at you. Um, and that's what you do. So that's what we did. And so um, actually, it was a uh, yeah last July. Wow, that was July 18. Well, that's oh, it's amazing. I'm just grokking. So this is this is Perseverance launching from Florida. There's Cape Canaveral there. Uh, there's Coca Beach down here. Uh, the shuttle launch area is over here. Uh, oh, it used to be the shuttle. Now it's uh, now it's uh, SpaceX launches area. Um, and the Saturn V was launched here. This is where the Redstone was launched over here. Uh, no, over over here. Anyway, um, anyway, it's a great place. It's a great launch. And so it, was, it launched an Atlas V and it got up there. And after eight months and 354 million miles on Thursday of, uh, oh, I forgot the date, in, uh, in, in February 18th of this year um, at 1236, um, we, it was looking like this. So this is the, this is the vehicle and its cruise configuration. The thing you see in the left here, that's the cruise stage. That's It's provided electricity. It's got solar panels on it. Um, and it and uh, and it also has these radiators because it turns out this this rover gets pretty hot in there. So we actually have freon um, that we pump around inside the rover um, to keep pull the heat out. And 
and and dispense with the heat with these radiators along the periphery, but facing the three degrees Kelvin of deep space. And when we get so we get, we chuck that thing a few minutes before getting to Mars, and uh, and then the then the vehicle is like a space capsule. And and what we did this time on Perseverance, just like we did with Curiosity for the first time, was that we actually flew at an angle and we steered the vehicle back and forth like a glider. Um, and we use that steering to, to modulate, adjust the distance uh, from where we're traveling so that we make sure that we land in the right landing spot. And in, person, in case of Curiosity, we're landing at the foot of Gale Crater, of Mount Sharp, which is about the size of, of Denali, by the way. It's a pretty big mountain. Um, and, uh, and this one is landing uh, right next to that uh, mud flow in that, at the uh, Jezero Crater. And so what happens, we kind of fly horizontally. But you, you, we first, if I didn't have those errors though, you'd say, well, it's coming in, it's going in, going to the lower right. No, it's actually going horizontally. So you actually go in at a little bit of an angle, then quickly level out and fly literally like an airplane. Uh, and we use that angle to get lift. And then uh, of course, then a few seconds after that, oops, back up here. Uh, come on, back up. Yeah, hold on. Oh, I thought that thing was live. Never mind. Okay, well, I was going to show. I thought I was going to show a video of the uh, of that. But I'll, I'll show another pair of parachutes. So we've had a lot of fun with parachutes, and I love showing parachute stories because parachutes are very dynamic things. And this is the kind of thing that happens a lot with our parachutes when we test them. This is a wind tunnel, the world's largest wind tunnel, uh, in uh, which which is a uh, eighty by a hundred foot width section of a of wind tunnel in uh, in. Uh, Sunnydale, California, the, the Ames Research Center. And, uh, and uh, we would test parachutes and this kind of thing would happen. We have to redesign them. And we would do like try to get strength testing. We would reef them in this configuration, try that. And things like this would go along. And eventually we, we, we eventually would get to think that get the parachutes to work. And then we'd say, well, let's go for, cause we need a bigger lander. We need a bigger parachute because we need to slow down. So, uh, so we did the test like we just, as you see right here uh, this is what you see there is a company called a balut, which is an inflation aid. But once we what we can see with these, we have two parachute tests going on in parallel here, uh, year apart actually. And this is what happened both times. Boom! Oh, ouch! You can see it was, these par, these tests were taken not in a wind tunnel, but done way above the surface of the earth. And uh, 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 in the tests, I was. You know, that that at the beginning of this my talk, he so, so I should see me standing next to a space capsule, and that's the space capsule that we were that launched these things off um, over Kauai, uh, uh, going going west from uh, the, the the far west side of Kauai at PMRF, and we tested two these parachutes in the hopes of expanding the, the tech capability envelope of parachutes, make, so we can have launch land bigger things. Well, it turned out didn't work so well because so we had to come up with a new test program without a space capsule. We did it again um, for this mission. We had to redesign a parachute. And this is what it's supposed to look like. Um, beautiful, beautiful parachute. It's, um, it worked, it worked, it worked famously. And, and, uh, but, it, but it, it, the amount of money and time it took, to, this is something, an area we've been working on for literally for 20 some years. And it's been just a real challenge. So we finally opened the parachute and then we ditched the heat shield. Uh, and then the 36, uh, uh, and then we get our first look at the surface of Mars. And for the first time, uh, Perseverance did something we'd never done before. And that is we diverted uh, and we used a, we actually took pictures so that the vehicle looked out the window, figured out where it was on a map from looking at the pictures and then took it, pulled out another map as well, if I'm a hazard map and says, which showed all the safe places and it figured out the nearest safe place to land. And that's exactly what happened. And so I'm gonna stop and just go here because I'm running out of time. Uh, oh, by the way, also, Oh, so then we look, do this do this whole thing with uh, lowering the rover down our ropes. So my teammates and I came up with that really over twenty uh, back in 2020, um, and we and we the idea really was born and uh, developed for Perseverance uh, for Curiosity rover. Um, the idea is uh, uh, it's it's easier to you know you can do like the like the Chinese did when they landed a, their rover on top deck of their their lander. You can do that, but the site has to be known to be safe in advance. Um, we, we, we couldn't, when we were doing curiosity, we didn't know how safe the surface was because we can't see the, that resolution from space. And we didn't have the technology, the compute power 
to do the kind of analysis we needed to do to do auto automatic hazard avoidance. So this was an alternative. Plus, what's more, once you land, you're actually, you actually you land, you have to climb off a lander. So, so this was the technique that we came up with called the sky crane maneuver, which uh, I like to describe as the least unsatisfactory way to land on Mars, land a big rover on Mars. So there's nothing, it's no, there's no, no such thing as the best. It's always the least unsatisfactory. Anyway, so we also put cameras on this thing and we lowered it down and uh, we cut the ropes and it flew away. And uh, now we're in this configuration uh, on the surface of Mars almost instantly. So let me just show a little video here uh, to see if I can get this thing to start. This is something. We are starting to straighten up and fly right. Can you guys hear that? Where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate indicate shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. So in a second, the rover the, the rover is going to do a divert. Nav filter converge. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second, altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Charge. So you're still going well over 200 miles an hour toward the ground with a big parachute. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation. This is and not a simulation. the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. You'll see in a minute, it's gonna separate and the vehicle is gonna make a left turn. It'll be a valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming, TPA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. So about ready to separate the lander, the vehicle, altogether from the back shell. Oh, there you go. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane Check maneuver. Check these out. Sky crane maneuver has started, <sighs> about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Woo! Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Cool, huh? Ooh, I love those cameras. So, so all that video you saw was not computer simulation, even though a simulation is looking really good these days. That's not. We are starting. Um, it, it's not. It's not simulation. That's all. Um, these we got these. Uh, relatively inexpensive uh, uh, off-the-shelf cameras, and we had to put it wrapped our own electronics around it. But um, we were able to put these little cameras everywhere, like the parachute next to the parachute, um, looking down from the descent stage, looking up from the rover, looking down from the rover, watching the heat shield separate. And um, so you, you saw all that stuff. Um, but that was that's a real history force first for us because we've been managing this in our mind's eye for you know for decades, and now we're actually see it with our own eyes. It's kind of cool. More than kind of cool. You know, we're practically in tears. That's, so, so this is our first panorama we got from the vehicle after we landed. Uh, um, you, you also know about the helicopter, and we lowered the helicopter. Oops, uh, we lowered the helicopter down um, uh, a couple of months, a couple of months ago, 
two, three months ago and uh, dropped it off and uh, left it there on the surface. Uh, and uh, there's a solar panel there, it's just two sets of blades that rotate in opposite directions. Uh, that, the, remember I said the air is really thin on Mars, 1%. So it's like, imagine you have to build, build a helicopter that flies at about, oh, 130,000 feet above the ground on Earth, about, about that. That's pretty high up. There's no mountains that high on Earth. That's many times higher than Mount, Mount, uh, uh, Mount Everest. So uh, those blades have to really go in fast. So 2,700 RPM. Those blades, if you put them on your finger, you can put one, you can hold them up with a little pinky. They're so light. That whole helicopter is, a, is, a, is about a uh, over two pounds. And uh, so there's a video right here of the, uh, let's see if I can get this thing started, of the helicopter fly. So, so you may say, what's the helicopter for? What, what does that have to do with sampling, looking for life? It's not, it's nothing to do with it. It's all about um, the fun of exploration. Is it working yet? Oh gosh, I'm sorry. And so it's a, it's really about, and this is a trial run of a technology. It's a technology demonstration. The idea of a helicopter like this, especially if it's free to run on its own, is to, is in this case, could be a scout for this, for the rover, for the, for our rover. In fact, that's what exactly what it's been doing. In fact, we did another, um, just a flight a couple of days ago, uh, in the evening, um, our evening, uh, it was daytime. It was around noon time at Mars. And then, so there's the helicopter looking out there. It doesn't go very high. It's only go you know, 10, 10, 20 feet at the most. Uh, we, may get, we may go with some higher flights. We originally were gonna quit by now, but turns out the science team of the rover really likes the imagery that this thing collects. And so, um, and, and not just imagery, but because it can actually fly over places that the rover can't drive on top of. And it and can actually scout out minerals because it's got a pretty decent camera, not mineral. We can look, it looks at mostly geomorpho geomorphology, the color and shape of the surface. Oh, there's the helicopter, came back, and guess what? It's going to come right back and land almost exactly where we dropped, where it took off from. That's pretty cool. Um, there's a, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the team was really good at guidance control of this thing. We had to redesign how, reimagine how helicopters work because there are no experts in flying helicopters on Mars. Uh, there are now, but there weren't before. Uh, so the, here we are. So we're also going to do sample collection. We've got these little sample tubes. There's a sample tube to your left there. Um, these are super sterile. I won't even tell you how, because my hour is up. Um, I might, won't even tell you how much, how, how difficult that is uh, to do, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to make super sterile, uh, not just sterile from a light perspective, but by, by or, organically clean. That means there's no carbon dioxide residue on this, these sample tubes. So the, there, these tubes are in sealed containers uh, inside sealed box that inside that uh, that's also sealed um, inside the belly of the rover, and we've we've now released the, uh, opened the doors that we, we we're only a few days away from actually going along and collecting our first tubes. Um, but we're not going to drop them off right away. But eventually, we're going to do this. We're going to take the tubes and drop them off. And you said, "Well, Rob, you know, what if you guys lose them? We won't lose them. Don't worry." Uh, we know where every rock we've ever seen on Mars is to within a meter, um, even now from even pre-ass missions, because we have this wonderful orbit, orbital imagery that we correlated with where our positions are. Uh, and I'm not going to worry about a sand dune coming by anytime soon, because sand dunes move glacially slow. And so um, our plan is eventually to take this, uh, take this, take the, go out, uh, land with a rover, uh, and go out and collect those tubes. And put them on a rocket, and then um, put them into in, into orbit in, in, inside a some uh, spacecraft the size of a basketball, and that basketball would then be hunted down by another orbiter. And the Europeans have, uh, have volunteered to do this. This is all planned. This is preliminary. This is this is something where we're just it's not official. We gotta remember everybody we reminded it we reminded all the time that this is, hasn't been approved yet through uh, through the normal legal channels. But we're we're working our way to it, this idea. And the idea is this ball goes into orbit on Mars and this orbiter grab, gob, gobbles it up, flies it home and puts it in a space capsule and then lands it in uh, uh, probably the Utah Test and Training Range at uh, in, near the Bonneville Salt Flats, salt flats in, in Utah. Same places we land uh, Genesis and, and the Stardust samples from outer space. And so, uh, so we have some re recent pictures. This is a picture. I remember I told you the helicopter takes some pictures as it flies around. This is actually a view from the helicopter. Taken about 10, 10 or so feet feet up on its flight, so it's able to. So you can imagine when you show this to the scientist team, they're going like, whoa, 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 show me that again. Can you guys keep doing that? 
so so now that now that the, the helicopter team is a, it flies every two weeks about on a two-week cadence and uh when the rover is not busy uh we'll we do helicopter flights and uh and look ahead scout out for the rover that's what we're doing i don't know how long it's going to last but we do but uh and in fact you can see there's there's the rover uh that's our view of the, the rover and wait look back here let me just actually let me zoom right in there how about that let's zoom in right there check out that there's see that little square back there with a the little dot in there that's a that's their helicopter it landed there um and then the rover caught up with it and you can see the rover tracks from the going from the left coming down we're kind of a driving south here and uh we passed the, the helicopter on the way down and uh now um so the helicopter is not there anymore it was there on saturday but uh i think on monday we hopped over it and hopped now it's i believe it's, it's about another 100 meters further south about a football field for the south and these are pictures actually these are pictures that just came down this morning kind of nice huh so you can go you can look at pictures that just came down you can be among the first human beings to see a picture if you go to the to the, our website look at the raw images that come back in color they come back from our various cameras this came down this morning also isn't that cool literally i mean and if you go to the website quick look and click you really might be the first human being to ever see that picture now well um and uh and this one too oh this was actually a little bit older but you can see this is this was taken a um this is taken a few couple weeks ago can you make out that little fuzzy thing here that's a uh, dust devil on mars going swooping swooping past the um those of you you know they come out on walla walla all the time you, we remember those right especially in the summertime it, they, they'd be dust devils in the farmer's fields um, blowing up all over the place and so we have the same thing on Mars. So I'm done. I'm well past my hour. Um, so I am all over time. So I can leave time for questions if there are any. Um, um, I think Nancy, you're giving out the pop quiz, right? I am. Exam. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I can okay. hear you. Yeah. All right. Our first question. Please explain why the samples collected by Perseverance are being dropped in the in place for later retrieval. Okay, we may have covered this. Requiring such a follow-up mission to retrace perseverance path would it not have been more efficient to store the samples on the rover where all could be retrieved at one time and place uh, mm, mm. oh yes great question well it turns out we can do both um, um we we so there's two issues so one is um in fact the rover will be holding on to them for quite a while we have a little parking lot for all our samples we can just leave them in the rover indefinitely but you don't want to leave them too long you know, these rovers, you know, even though we've been really lucky and our rovers last longer, we designed them. There's no doubt about that. Uh, they can still fail and there are still failure modes, single point failure modes where all that whole rover comes to a rock and halt and all those samples are now locked inside the rover, unretrievable. And so, so I, um, uh, uh, actually, it was me that actually came up with a nice idea of, of these individual sample tubes. Uh, and it gives it gives the scientists an opportunity to, to create caches of these pot basically make a little pile of, of tubes as they go along through the mission. Um, uh, what happens is it's part of it too is about risk management. So if, if you say, say you collected a whole bunch of great samples that you really like, and you find a nice place for a future lander to land that's gonna with a rope fetch rover that can go fetch them, you can then plunk them all down on one spot. But then then you can hike if your rover still has more life left then you can hightail it up into the up into the cliffs and go to more dangerous places to uh dangerous places where you know you can collect even more samples but you know that there's a nice safe pile over there and and so the idea is, is that you can spread the risk out over time uh, but the, the answer is yes we can do either one we can just keep them all inside and just wait until the, to uh, to uh, to another vehicle land uh, arrives and then which hasn't been designed yet or built. So it's gonna be a while. Um, and then we can take that, come by and, and, and say, here, here's all our samples, clunk, 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 drop them all off. Um, I, I I'd be reluctant to do that um, just because I don't trust my own engineering skills, our own engineering skills that were that good because this could be many years from now. And so um, we've gotta we got to recognize that we're not perfect. And so, so the answer to the other question is, yeah, these, so, so remember the whole purpose of doing sample return, sample returning samples back to earth, uh, if we're allowed to do that, is, uh, is because we believe, because we, the kind of instrumentation that would detect um, life in rock 
it's really hard to take with you to Mars. It's really big and heavy. Um, uh, even, even 10 years from now, it's still going to be pretty remarkable. And it's, and it's a huge diversity of different kinds of equipment. So the great thing about taking these core samples, we can take them and break them into little tiny pieces and then send them to different laboratories around the world. Uh, and so uh, to look for uh, ancient life, um, and, and, and which will basically in the form of maybe shales or, or, uh, or other uh, crushed carbon uh, uh, and alter, probably chemically altered car carbon uh, uh, organic molecules that have been altered and interact with the rocks. So it's going to be hard to tease that story apart. But uh, so we really need to have samples to do that. And we need a diversity of samples from a large, large array of places. So that's why this rover is mobile. We're just not grabbing a few rocks, putting them in a rocket and sending it back because we wouldn't get the diversity that we need in order to tell the story of Mars. So um, that's why we're doing it. Thanks, Ron. Jeff asks, from what we know, uh, from what we now know of Mars's atmosphere, would it be impossible for Mars to experience our northern lights phenomenon? Um, so far, it, it, most of it's not so much the atmosphere as the fact that there's no mag the magnetic field of Mars is almost absent. Um, it's almost it's, it, there was there we believe there was one at one time because there's signs of magnetic fields trapped in rock. Um, but uh, in the residual rock, just like just like on Earth, you can find rocks uh, where Earth's the direction of Earth's magnetic field is actually trapped in the rock itself. And each new layer is a rock that's laid on top of it traps the direction because that's how we discovered that the North Pole and the South magnetic pole swap directions relatively frequently. And we may be in the middle of a of a, uh, a reversal coming up. As a matter of fact, not not dangerous, but it's it's because it happens fairly. It's, it's not going to be a life-threatening aspect, but, but because Mars doesn't have any field, it doesn't have the ability to coalesce the, uh, uh, the, the uh, ions, uh, these high energy particles. And, inter and then, of course, that's one. And the second thing, because the atmosphere is so thin, it, you, don't see, you don't see the, uh, the uh, uh, well, it's, the atmosphere doesn't play much of a role. It's mostly all the magnetic field. So there is, that's why we won't see it. Don't see them from space that much. It doesn't mean it's zero, it just it hasn't been seen yet. It's not very bright. It'd be very dim. Unlike a place like Jupiter, which is just rocking and rolling with, with, with Aurora, uh, same with Saturn. Um, they both have very strong magnetic fields, and those particles really get rocking and rolling. And uh, there's all sorts of electrical effects on these on these other planets, uh, lightning and other and other uh, phenomena because of the a uh, lot more going on there. Thank you, Ron. Dave has a question. Can you talk briefly about how you control your machines remotely? How yeah, yeah, I are they? Yeah, that, I, I really should have done that. Um, this is why an hour, it's so tough to figure out what to talk about. Um, uh, yeah, so what we learned, we build both Pathfinder and Spirit Rover and other rover is that in order to, uh, we really can't, um, we can't joystick. There's, first of all, there's not enough power. We don't get enough electricity on Mars from solar power, or I didn't mention it, uh, what's powering Perseverance and Curiosity is 100, or each have their own 100 watt power supply, only 100 watts, you know, it's, it's an old fashioned light bulb, right? Um, uh, coming from a plutonium source that eventually a bunch of, a bunch of plutonium rocks surrounded by thermocouples, which produce uh, about 100 watts of electricity. And uh, that's not a lot of electricity. And, and our rovers operate on more than 100 watts when you turn them on. So you need a you need a design where um, you basically uh, you need a design where the vehicles are sleeping most of the time. Our rovers are asleep almost all the time. If we try to operate them with a with the two way light time, we're up anywhere between five and twenty minutes one way each each way for light. Um, we never we it'd be on all the time. And not to mention that light time delay is makes for you just can't you're 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 running really slow all the time. And so we don't have enough power to keep the thing, our radios even on. So what we do is we program these vehicles to be intelligent, autonomous vehicles that do all. What we do in the what they do is they they sleep all night long. Around ten o'clock in the morning, Mars time. By the way, I didn't mention Mars has a day that's twenty four hours and thirty nine minutes long. That means if you're working in a Mars time, as our team members were up until very recently, um, you're sleeping in thirty nine minutes every day. Kind of nice, you know. But your families get tired of it because you're then coming in the middle of the night. It's very, it's very, 
It's very disruptive. Um, so uh, but the, so we, the rover sleeps all night, off, and at 10 o'clock in the morning, it wakes up roughly, just in time for our, an antenna on the rover to face Earth. And, and on schedule, a, 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 uh, we've, over, while the rover was asleep, we constructed a script, a list of things to do. And we send that script up as a series of ones and zeros that fly through space, just like an email message. One through, ones, ones and zeros going across through space, hitting, hitting the antenna just in time for the rover to wake up. The rover says, oh, got a bunch of, got, I got a whole script for the day. Um, let me see, mm, what, oh, by the way, I'm gonna turn the rate, my radio on for just a few minutes, just to let them know I got it. So I put, the rover makes a little beep and, and you, know, you know, five to 20 minutes later, the deep space network receives a little beep. It says, oh, this is, it got the message, okay, good. So we don't, and so the rover doesn't say any more after the rest of the day, and just it's absolutely silent. It just, but it just does. It just follows the script. And the script it says, "Well, today, see what's what's." And the plan might be more than just one day. It might just be even be a couple days. And that's what we do now is we send a two-day plan, and we'll say, "Okay, we're, we're to, to this, this afternoon they want me to drive over here, and then I'm going to be take, looking at some sky images over here. Then I'm going to be looking looking at the horizon over there. I'm going to be looking at that rock over there, and and so we we give a whole bunch of things to do, and a rover just does it." At the end of the day, usually somewhere between three and six, one of our orbiters will fly overhead. And, and, and there's some orbiters that fly out more frequently than that. Uh, we have a bunch of them now, including the Europeans that are helping us out. Um, uh, basically, when they fly over, the rover has a schedule when, the, when those things uh, fly over. And what happens when the rover is done with the things it needs to do for the day, it takes a nap and then it wakes out, per, wakes itself up by per its schedule. To, and it's and it, when it knows an orbiter is overhead, it then starts sending all the information that it collected during the day to the orbiter with the, via a separate antenna. That this, this is here, here's all the pictures, orbiter. Get it? Yeah, you got it. Okay, good. Thanks. See you later. And the orbiter is long gone because the orbiter is only overhead for five to 15 minutes typically, unless, unless, unless it's what the European orbiter, which tends, 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 spends a lot more time in the sky. Um, this is further away. And then, uh, and then those orbiters forward all the information to Earth. It turns out many of our images have come back through the, uh, the uh, trace gas orbiter, which is a European orbiter. Um, and uh, that orbiter actually takes, gets all our pictures forwards it, not the deep space network, but forwards it to, it might the deep space, but also forwards it to its own network, including networks in Russia, which then forwards the, those pictures back to us. And then we put them all together into our, into the videos and images you see. And so um, that's how we do it. And then, so then the rover, as soon as it, it's done going overhead, it goes, puts itself back to sleep until it wakes up again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. So that is the, that's the day in the life of a rover. Um, it's pretty much, uh, Autonomous, when we tell it to drive, we don't tell it how to steer. We just say, drive over there. We, we might give it some waypoints of where you want. So go this way, but stop over here, then over here, then over here. And, um, but it, and it figures out, looks for hazards. It tries to do things safely. If there's a hole it didn't know about, it stops. If there's a cliff or a big rock we didn't tell it about, it stops. And so uh, um, it's it's uh, designed. And, and when we move the arm around, the arm knows about where the wheels are, it knows where the ground is. It's keeping track of where things are, so it's actually got a mental picture of the surrounding terrain of the because it's got stereo vision and it can produce just like your, you do with your brain. It can produce a stereo image map on board, and that's how and that's how uh, the, we get, so the vehicle actually figures out its own context. And so our vehicles are really fully autonomous rovers in that respect. Slow. They don't move very fast. Things don't happen. Those the fastest this thing goes is about three to four centimeters per second. It's like so. It goes bzz, bzz, bzz. It's about this fast as the wheel turns. The arm moves like this. Bzz, bzz. Everything is in slow mo, um, but we're not there to be irritated by it. It just happens, and you know. We're not even watching it, so it's not even bothering us. We just wait for it to happen. So does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Colson has a question. How do you navigate a rover on Mars from Earth long term without GPS or a similar global navigation technology and also without a consistent magnetic pole to reference the compass off of, do rovers, and especially the Ingenuity helicopter, 
primarily use local geographical features and intrinsic inertial guidance like an accelerometer and a gyroscope, or do they use completely different techniques? No, they, they do exactly what you just said. It's, it's uh, you know, we can't, there's no GPS, right? And, and there's no magnetic field, so can't use a compass. But, but you know, the rover actually can, because it has an inertial measurement system, which is basically a combination of a, a gyro, which is like the inner ear, and an accelerometer, which tells you which way down, you can sense with, like your butt, which way down is. And so it can it, it, it can also determine can actually it's sense enough to feel the rotation of the Earth, and so it can figure out way where uh, not magnetic north is, but where uh, geographical north is from the from the by gyro gyro compassing. But once it figures that out, it doesn't really forget it because it's no one's taking the rover when it's asleep and turn it around. So once it figures out where it is, it's pretty much got it. And then, so so when we drive, it's all terrain relative or image relative motion. Um, we also use the inertial these inertial measurement systems to actually get a sense for how much you move, accelerate. But because the motions when you're driving are so slow when you're driving, the IMU this inertial measurement system isn't really that useful. You tell tilt, it's mostly wheel turns and using your eyes, the cameras. On the helicopter side, because it is moving fairly quickly. Um, it uses a small inertial measurement system, very tiny one, uh, uh, to, to do almost all of its flying. So it's really closing its eyes. It's not using its eyes to, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to decide where to land. It comes back to where we tell it to land. But we tell it in an inertial frame. So we, we say that you're here this way. You, this is north for you, and you, you figured out which way north is. And so we want you to go basically to this coordinates and it will fly the the coordinates and use its inertial measurement system to get to those coordinates um, alone, pretty much with its eyes closed. Now it does have cameras that look down. We could do that in principle, but, but we've not developed the software to do that yet. Thank you, Rob. Steve asks, with the success of the COTS landing recorder cameras and ingenuity, do you expect more COTS use on future planetary probes for non-mission critical oh, applications? Great, great question. COTS is commercial off the shelf. That's what COTS stands for. And so, um, yeah, um, so we also use call it COTS for short. Um, yeah, so um, we um, so there's a challenge whenever you put something that's that you it's really hard to prove will work because you don't do all the testing you need to do. Um, uh, but you have to prove that it does no harm. So we had to do, we had to make sure that no failure modes of those cameras can cause the vehicle to crash, right? Um, so, so, and we, by the way, we had to do the helicopter. We had to make sure we put the helicopter, there was no failure modes of the helicopter, including its deployment, that would kill the rover's mission. So we had to, we had to do a lot of work at those interfaces to make sure that if this thing, shorts out or something happens, it doesn't hurt anything. So it's few, you know, fuses and things of that sort. Uh, so, um, so yes, yeah, so we're looking at, for example, we're using exactly that same camera. We're putting on a spacecraft called SWAT, which is a, which is a, a spacecraft with a big radar on it that's going to look for um, changes in, the, in water on the planet Earth. So it's, it's an orbiter that we're, that we're working on right now at JPL. And it's, um, it's really looking at, uh, how drought, you mentioned drought, uh, Nancy, earlier, um, how drought is affecting, how, how reservoirs are shrinking and growing throughout the year by measuring, by sending radar signals down and looking at the shapes of water on, on the planet. And we'll have an inventory of fresh water uh, from this spacecraft for the first time ever uh, in gallons or uh, approximately at least air surface area. But we have to deploy these fancy antennas and we want to make sure these antenna deployment is, is done properly. So we said, well, when we, when we get a, use one of these spare cameras and put it on board and watch the deployment process as an engineering process. So we, yeah. And we're, now we're, we're looking at for other things too. I don't know if you remember, they did, we've done the same thing now for rockets. You watch when, when a rocket launches, there are many, many times the rockets have cameras that are looking at the ground as the rockets flying away. We see that on SpaceX, right? Their vehicles, they put in cameras on their launch. So again, they have these low cost commercial off the shelf cameras that allows them to get these imagery. Uh, as long as you put a nice do no harm interface on it, you can fly them uh, and, 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 and make sure you're not too expensive. So the price is right. 
Uh, Natalie wants to know, what is a lesson, technical or not, you learned from designing rovers to send to Mars that you come back to most, come back to the most? Well, I think I, I would say the lesson that come, we come back to most for almost everything, whether it's rovers or not, is 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 the incredible. Um, I'm kind of I try to I'm kind of simplifying it in my conversation here, but the the level of complexity these things have is really through the roof. Um, uh, it's almost fr has fractal like complexity. The more you peel the onion, look at closer, there's more detail at, at every level as you get. Um, um, there's a, the, the real key is how, how as human beings, how do we manage that complexity? How do we manage our own fallibility as human beings? I think um, one of the things that I find is uh, that's uh, really true uh, is that almost everything we do as engineers is about fighting our own weaknesses as human beings, our own inability to see things clearly, our own um, self-deceptions, um, our own inability to listen, our own inability to uh, to visualize or imagine the worst case consequences for things. Um, uh, so you're seeing us doing these ama amazing things and you can think, well, if you can do that, then you can do anything. Well, I think we should have a, you need, we need, you know, to do these kinds of things, you have to be fearless and bold. There's no doubt about that. But you have to be incredibly wise about what our own limitations as human beings. And in a sense, design these things for human beings um, and, and for our own ability to understand. Because we, because you, you know, we, you know, you, you guys are all seeing, you know, AI is becoming a big thing. We're, we're putting more things in, into software. Um, a lot of the complexity is being managed for us with these tools. I mean, for example, many of our complex circuits are now designed with with software that synthesizes many of these designs for us. But um, it, we. It, but we still need to get our arms around it. We, we, we are responsible for making these things work. And we're responsible for making sure that they don't, that they, you know, they, they don't, that they can't, uh, I'm sorry, saying right, but he's basically responsible for making it work. And, and that's, and that's, that responsibility means that we have to think very critically, self-critically about our own inability to see what, what might, might go wrong. And so, uh, uh, I think that's the biggest lesson, and I teach that at JPL. I teach. We talk about we talk about failure, learning from failure, uh, lessons learned. How do we? How do we? How do we? Uh, how how to be unafraid to talk about our own weaknesses as people and our own mistakes that we've made? I mean, I don't, I don't know if you know that. You know, we, you, you've seen Curiosity wheels. You, you, some of you may have read about the Curiosity's wheels have big, huge tears in them. Well, I was chief engineer. What happened, Rob? What what what? What, did, what we Rob? What was what was I thinking? Um, how did we get? How did we launch a vehicle with wheels that were, you know, the very beefy-looking vehicle with incredible ground clearance with these with these big six wheels with big six big high torque motors in each of the wheels? You should be able to drive over anything. Yet um, our wheels were being torn apart by uh, by the the rocks on Mars and um, uh, our, our inability as, a, as human beings as us uh, to visualize what was really going on physically was these wheels were turning on the surface of Mars. And uh, it's a kind of a longer story there, but but uh, um, I take personal full, full responsibility for that. Our whole team, we all we all had the same kind of you know brain fart, right? We we thought we understood how the physics of those things work. We were all wrong, and, and so so I am not ashamed. I tell people that I've made I I have personally damaged. Okay, in, that in, that aside, th hardware flight equipment on three separate spacecraft. Now you might say, "Well, Rob, obviously you're you're very dangerous. You stay away from it. <laughs> like," and that's probably true. Uh, but but I think that um, the point is, I you know when you learn, all three are different mistakes. So I I have to give myself some credit there. But but uh, but the key the key is sh when, when you make a mistake, learn about what happened. I'm trying to understand fundamentally where it went wrong. What was what about your thinking or your actions that caused that problem to happen? And then share it widely with your team and your team members and encourage them to also um, be unafraid to talk about our own uh, mistakes and, and misses. And uh, it's hard because as human beings, you know, we're, we, we, uh, we, we don't want to show off our own weaknesses. Um, and it, and uh, but I think, I think in the long run, if we encourage that um, and encourage that fellow appreciation of our fallibility, we'll go farther and we'll be more successful as we go forward. And so 
That's just, I think that's just the, that's one of the, th that's one of the key common threads in all of this stuff is, is the, uh, just, is the, uh, how easy it is for us to be wrong. Thank you, Robin. You basically um, answered Jay's question. He asked about the holes in the tires on Curiosity Rover. Oh, so yeah. um, I will um, skip and go on to the next question from Margaret. What concerns do you have about bringing back potentially biologically active samples from Mars? Well, um, many of us, well, Aside whether you whatever you whatever you your belief system says about how likely the uh, life will be there, just put that aside. We are we are if we were to do this, we are taking the assumption that this is highly hazardous uh, material that we're bringing back, regardless of the story of organic uh, sterilization due to cosmic rays and, and other other phenomenology that would that would that would probably sterilized because these samples are being taken fairly close to the surface of Mars. Um, put that aside, we, we need to do this work with that assumption that, that they are ha extraordinarily hazardous, hazardous and do everything in our power to make sure that, that they are not inadvertently released into, into the Earth's, uh, Earth's uh, environment. And so, uh, the the uh, the kinds of things that we're talking about doing is be really impressed. Um, uh, we're we're taking these samples, we're putting them in in double and triple sealed containers. We're welding them closed with a welding arc welder. We're we're making sure that the outer surface, the thing that gets gets transported, uh, is completely free of even the tiniest single speck of any bit of Mars. Um, uh, and we're making sure that uh, uh, that that the systems that we build are you cannot they cannot not work. That's where we're trying to mix. In other words, there there are virtually anything that breaks still results in success. And uh, for example, you might be surprised to learn that our space capsule we're envisioning doesn't have a parachute. He said, "Rob, you, you need a parachute for heaven's sake. You're landing on Earth." Well. You know what? We need to design a system so it works without a parachute. So let's make it extraordinarily robust. So it just literally falls out of the sky with a fairly steep entry entry angle, and uh, and drop it on the ground and make sure it's so robust. No matter how you slam it into the surface, it's never going to break. And it's possible to come from that perspective. And that's what we've been doing for these several years. And that's the design path we've been on. Um, uh, now I do say, will say, there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't be too worried about the odds of organic, I mean, uh, organic material or uh, active organic material at all. I mean, bio, bioactive material at all. Um, one is that's just the nat natural environment, um, both on the on Mars itself, but also on the journey. But it's very difficult for that that uh, for that bioactive material to have developed pathogenic ten tendencies because. As you know, on this planet, pathogens are are have to be evolved into their into the into the uh, ecosystem for them to become pathogenic at all. Um, but that's just you know, and, and we also know that like Mars rocks have come back to this planet uh, all the time, uh, and they still continue to this day landing on this planet. Um, uh, but that still that doesn't justify. See, even all those aside, you, you have to put all those aside and just assume it's dangerous. And so that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And we're um, uh, and I remember I mentioned the fallibility thing. We've got to we've got to constantly think about how to make it so it works every single time. It's a lot of testing, by the way. Yeah, but keep it simple. That's the that's the that's the real that's the real mantra. That help okay. answer the question. Um, Dave asks, are there other sensors or sampling systems that JPL would like to send to Mars? Oh, yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole, uh, well, right now we're focusing on bring, bringing, the bringing the samples back, um, uh, assuming it gets approved. Uh, it, it's now, it's, it's still in the planning stages, but, but uh, there's plenty of, Mars, is, I showed you all these little things, all these places on Mars where things have been explored. Landed, um, but it represents a minute fraction of the total planet. The planet has incredible diversity. I mean, it, really, we've we've explored an area not 
much, much bigger than, uh, probably less than the size of a county uh, for all emissions combined. Uh, and so you can imagine this, this, there's as much surface area on Mars as there is land area on this planet. And so you can imagine Mars has a lot of diversity, a lot of places to explore. And then many scientists would love to send things like a Raman spectrometer or, or, a, um, or, or land something at the, at the poles of, the Mar of Mars and study both the, the water and the CO2 uh, ice, ice caps. Um, uh, there are places, there, there, is, there are uh, huge, huge areas of Mars that are really, unfortunately, off limits for us because they're too high up. There's not enough air there to land. And so, um, so uh, having a vehicle that could really hike, go fast, and explore wide areas, including vehicles that can climb down some of these caves and these pits that we've seen from outer space, uh, from orbit, uh, we'd love to be able to do that. Or fly a helicopter inside. Um, uh, we would love to have um, equipment that would allow us to, you know, to, to, to do uh, uh, much, much more refined, even more than we've done so far, we find um, uh, 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 isotopic analysis for isotopic dating of, 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 of Mars. And we've done some of that um, with, with Perseverance, but um, we would love to send much more elaborate uh, 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 radiocarbon and I, 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 uh, uh, dating systems that allow us to, 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 to to really peel back the end and see how old the rocks we're looking at really really are. We do we do we do, we know it pretty well from a rough perspective, but we would love to get more resolution there considerably. Thank you, Ron. Um, it's two thirty two. We there are more questions in the chat. Um, you can stick just, around if you guys want to. Well, we still have nearly a hundred people who are still with wow. us. So um, why don't we take three more questions. And if there's questions left, would you be willing to follow up with email to those questions? Yes, if, if you don't mind being an a, a intermediary for me. Okay, <laughs> like yes, a, yes, know. happy to do that. Uh, my inbox can get, gets really full. I, I understand how that can happen. <laughs> um, so Brett wants to know, how are the colors and designs of parachutes chosen and what purposes do they serve? Oh, you're probably thinking. Remember that uh, the uh, you saw that video, the uh, the, the video of, taken of the real parachute inflation. This complicated pattern of 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 uh, uh, international orange and undyed natural fabric. And so we have so it's really only two colors, really really one color, uh, international orange or no color. It's just the natural uh, the natural fabric. Uh, and uh, what you, uh, what we've, what we've, uh, what we have, some, we can just leave. We we actually flown all sorts of combinations. We've done stripes. We've done all natural. We've done um, all orange. Um, what we, um, because we had a camera on this one, we we chose to put a pattern on it that we, we wanted to put a pattern that we can. So if the parachute has inflated, with because we could, we want to be able to look at it in super slow mo. So we slow the video down, even though it's not a super high high speed camera that we put on it. Um, but, but we want to be able to make out what happened, especially if the inflation turned out to be more complex than what we uh, than what really happened. And the, the inflation we saw was this almost ideal circular inflation versus no, none of the C shapes that we sometimes see. So we're very happy about that. Um, but we put a pattern on so you can make those distinctions out. You want to be able to see which. And we also want an ID system to be able to see what the clocking is of the fabric. So which is you know which is gore number one, which is which is gore number sixty four, I think something like that. I think it's six, six or 90, 90, 96, I think ninety six gores. I can't remember. Um, and so you want to be able to see that. So, but the pattern that you saw was more than that. My friend Ian Clark, uh, he's uh, he used to be a young man. He's been around for a while now, but he's he's a uh, He's, a, he's one of our parachute experts, and he and I work closely on a parachute test program, the ones that tore apart. He and I work very uh, like this. He was given the job of deciding what the pattern is, and he worked with the parachute manufacturer, and he picked a pattern um, that, if, if you know, it, it actually spells out. Uh, and we did this, he sort of did this in secret. He, the team knew he was doing it, but we didn't know what he was going to do, because um, we didn't want to let the secret out. 
um, he set out this pattern and it basically spells, says, um, says two things. It says, dare mighty things, which is J one of JPL's mottos. It also had the latitude longitude for JPL's at the front gate of JPL uh, and the letters JPL. Um, and, uh, and so it was actually a secret coded message. It was actually needed and fun because the colors can be anything you want. The colors don't change the strength of the fabric. Um, all I had to do is, can you figure out where, which is gore one? <laughs> and can you make out, it, it put enough diversity in it so it, it correlates, it has a nice uh, autocorrelation function if you, if you try to do image processing on it. And it could, so you could do it on anything practically. And, uh, and he chose one that actually had a, uh, had a secret message in it. And then it was, it, we, were, we were curious as how long it would take before people figured it out. And I think it only took, a, I think it was about 24 hours before uh, a man and his dad uh, figured out, I forget even where that, where I think they may not have been in this country. I can't remember, but uh, it was great. Um, I, I loved it. I love that. I love these little stories. I you know, for example, we used to, we didn't do it this time because it had already been done. But uh, if you remember, we put Morse code in the, in the, uh, in the wheel cup patterns in the, uh, on the, on the Curiosity's wheels, uh, which by the way, it's a good thing because it turns out they're much stronger where the Morse code is than where they are. Um, I should have done the Morse code everywhere, then I wouldn't have had this wheel problem. But, um, but the uh, Morse code spells out JPL, the letters JPL. And so it's driving along, leaving the, in Morse code, the letters JPL on the surface of Mars where, as it drives along. And, and uh, depending on the, on the winds, um, those, with the, those uh, letters could be there for quite a few years, probably maybe thousands of years, so. I love the human touch that you, yeah. you put into your work. Um, and here's um, a question from Eric, and it's about Whitman Connections. Have, your, uh, have you and Dave Gingrich, class of 79, careers overlap, Dave being employed at Lockheed in space science? And I would add to the yes. question, are there other witties working with you at JPL or in, in the industry where you, uh, your work overlaps? Yeah, there are. Um, uh, Yes, I know. I, I work with him, uh, Dave Gingrich. I have uh, uh, there's another Dave um, uh, who works at JPL, who's a graduate. Um, uh, we have uh, 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 some of you might remember other three two. Uh, 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 her name is now Susie Dodd, but I can't remember what her her her, her name was before she married Clint. Uh, but she is she is actually a project manager for the Voyager mission, the very famous Voyager project. She's still, and she's also manager of JPL's Deep Space Network. And so there's another witty there. Um, and there's others that, 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 that are running to now and again. Um, some of them are three, two, um, not all of them are, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's really great that, uh, that, that, uh, oh yeah, Dave, Dave Atkinson's on, uh, is, is one of the, uh, is another witty. In fact, he's listening. I think you on Dave. Yeah, he, I think he might be here too. And so he's another one. So yeah, we have a few. Um, That's great. Around. They're everywhere. You know, witties are everywhere. So, did your dream of becoming a space engineer? Um, would you say that um, your real life experience has exceeded your wildest imagination? By far. And, and what's next? What's in store next for um, your work? <sighs> I. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to keep doing this chief engineer for the laboratory for JPL as a whole uh, for a little while longer. But I, it's a, uh, I, to be honest with you, um, I've been at JPL, I've been JPL working now for 40 years, a long time. And I, uh, I'm getting a little, a little tired, I guess. Um, there's a lot of stress and, and, and I have to, my brain has to be on all the time. Uh, and I, I would like to, I would like to find a job where I, I could, especially with COVID, you know, we, we have, we have a system here, Jacob, where, where we could do, like, uh, we could do, uh, even before COVID where we could do 980, which is, I could work nine days, uh, uh, over two, over two weeks, getting 80 hours on average over those two weeks. And so, uh, that means I would get every other Friday off. Um, uh, that's been great. And, but being at home, um, I, my, my, my meetings are like this all the time, boom, 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 all the time. But there's something nice about having it when there's no meetings, I can just kind of stand up, walk, I can pull out, pull out and practice my trumpet 
and I'm learning, I'm still, I'm still taking jazz lessons. Um, and, um, and just sort of relax. And so this is a sense of me that I, I'm feeling like, uh, you know, maybe retirement isn't that far away after all. But so I, I, I might, there's a lot going on at JPL. This, this whole sample return thing is a huge deal. JPL's got a bunch of other missions, including Earth, Earth, uh, uh, Earth biology missions, um, so studying biology from space. Um, we're, uh, we're involved in uh, new of Venus, two, three Venus missions that just got announced uh, just recently. Uh, so JBL is, is full of exciting missions, exciting things to do. And you know, the thing is, there's no shortage of things to learn um, and, uh, and, and things to discover out there. And, uh, uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, that, that my work now is really to try to make sure that, uh, that, we, that, that we are ready, the next generation is ready, next generations, plural, are ready to take over and do those do amazing things and dare made mighty things and succeed. Thank you, Rob. I, I think we'll um, close our questions and thank you for all of the work that you put in and for the amazing work that you do uh, with your colleagues. And we're, Whitman is proud of you. And um, oh, thank you. We're, we're so um, proud to call you one of our own. So well, congratulations you. on I'm, all I'm, your successes. I, I'm, I'm proud to be from Whitman and what a great place. I mean, I have to admit it was, it was a wonderful experience going to school there and uh, I learned so much and met some amazing people. So that was my first introduction to meeting amazing people and, uh, and what, what you can do when you use your head and, uh, and, and, and think and, and be productive. So it was, it was, it's been a real treat. So thank you all very much. Thanks for your, thanks for listening today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everybody.